Hello, Pastor Gavin Whitcomb Sr. here from Moores Mountain Church near Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Are you ready to dig into the Word? Thanks for joining me with this podcast. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask you now to bless and lead and guide us as we study your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've been going through a verse-by-verse study of the book of Colossians, and currently we are in chapter 2. We're ready to begin chapter 2, and we're going to focus on on verses 1 through 3. There's a lot in these verses, so that's all the further we're going to get today. Let me read to you Colossians 2, verses 1 through 3. For I would ye knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the fullest assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now here in Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, if I were to give a title to this study, I'd say true wisdom and knowledge are found in Christ. Now the believers in Colossae had never seen Paul face to face, but through his writings, especially the book of Colossians here, they could see his heart. And he wants them to know how much he cares for them so that they'll be more apt to take his warnings to heart and to heed his instruction. So in verse 1 he says, I would ye knew, in other words, I want you to know, I wish you would know, what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea. There's a church there as well, right? And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. So Paul says, I have a great conflict conflict for you and for other Christians who I'm I haven't even met but I still have this great conflict for them what does he mean conflict well conflict is the Greek word agon from which we get the English word agony or agonize and the the, the word uh, agon or conflict as it's translated here it's used to describe uh, for one thing really serious competition in athletics because in athletics if you're really striving the best you can and you're trying to win sometimes it is agonizing you face exertion you give it all you got you know you're people that are running in a race you know especially sprints they are running and you know sometimes there's some pain involved in, in that exertion right some agony I know how it is when I was in high school and I used to wrestle Uh, We would have wrestling tournaments, and uh, boy, I'll tell you, you agonize. You you put forth an effort, and it's it in some ways it's very uncomfortable. But you're you're pushing yourself and you're striving, and it's so. This word agon, which he he says, I have. I want you to know what great conflict I have for you. It also refers to struggles within the soul. And also struggles outwardly. So we as believers are on God's side in the struggle against and conflict against evil. And Paul is engaged in this conflict for them. So he's engaged in serious prayer for them as well as in the struggle to advance the truth. Especially like if they're getting assaulted by these false doctrines and false teachings... He does not want them to fall prey to it. So he uh, he's struggling to advance the truth so that God's people would understand and continue to uphold it. So that's the conflict he has for them in prayer and in uh, asserting and standing up for and proclaiming the truth so that God's people are not misled. So in other words, he cares about them. Now in verse 2, It says that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. Now, what does all that mean? Well, let's unpack it. 
First of all, in, in verse 2, Paul describes what the Lord would want to see in and through the Colossians. And of course, you know, what, what relevance does that have for us today? Well, this, that it gives us a glimpse of God's will for us in our church today. Some of the very things that the Colossians needed and Paul was praying for and struggling for and seeking for, we need today. We need our hearts it says that their hearts might be comforted, be knit together in love. We need our hearts comforted. The word comfort there is the uh, uh, parakalesis. Uh, same word to use to describe the Holy Spirit. Para alongside of and kalesis to call, to call to one side and to help and assist. And so comforted here means they're strengthened and encouraged that their hearts might be comforted. Does God want our hearts to be strengthened and encouraged in him? You bet. And then he says, be knit together in love. So God wants his people to be knit together in love. That speaks about unity, knit together. So God wants unity among his people uh, as in love, as they love one another. So true love and unity among God's people, well, that's, that's the result of being filled with and guided by the Holy Spirit as we walk in the truth of God's word. Remember Galatians 5 tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is what? In other words, what will the Holy Spirit of God produce within us <clears throat> as we are fully yielded to him and surrendered to him and we walk in the Spirit, guided and influenced by and directed by the Spirit of God? Well, the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, uh, self-control, right? That's the fruit of the Spirit. But, it, but the first fruit of the Spirit mentioned is love. And this unity, uh, this being knit together speaks of unity. The unity that the Holy Spirit produces is centered around the truth. There are a lot of people that, that are pushing for unity just for the sake of unity. But the, and, and their idea is that, oh, we can uh, get together and cooperate with people that are heretics and apostates and don't even preach the true gospel. Yeah, we can cooperate with them. Let's just have unity. But that's not the unity of the Holy Spirit. You know, John sixteen three. Jesus said that the spirit of truth, that's what he called the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, that's his name. He, when he's come, he'll guide you into all truth. Whatever he hears, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So the Holy Spirit of God is called the spirit of truth. Why? Because he's God, and he's truth, and he always tells the truth, and he is of the truth, and he never lies. So... God cannot lie, so the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, it says, With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, so we're to be humble, right? And gentle, lowliness and meekness, with long suffering. That speaks about being patient towards other people and their faults and failures and shortcomings. Forbearing one another in love. In other words, putting up with and patiently bearing with their faults. Uh, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now what's it say, we, we, what did Paul tell the Ephesians we are to endeavor to do? To keep or maintain the unity of the Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit of God produces unity among the people of God as we're filled with the Spirit and we walk in the Spirit, guided by and influenced by and directed and led by the Spirit of God, yielding to his leading in our life. So this unity of the Spirit is centered around the truth. Now, all truths in those scriptures are important, but not all truths are of equal importance. So the, the truths about Jesus and who he is and how to be saved how to have eternal life, how to be born again. Uh, they're very important. Not quite as important as the, the uh, genealogies in First Chronicles. 
Or are the are the genealogies in First Chronicles true? Yes, absolutely. But are they as crucial and important as the teachings and doctrines of salvation, how to be saved? No. So all truths are important, but not all truths are of equal importance. And there are some truths that are they're foundational to the Christian faith, like the Bible's Word of God and the deity of Christ and its companion doctrine, the Trinity, and that salvation is by grace through faith. That there's some of the foundational truths of the faith. There are many principles in Scripture that are very clear. But there are also disputable matters that are not clear in Scripture. There are things in the Bible that aren't real clear, and they're subject to varying interpretations on which good, faithful Christians differ, right? Uh, some of these things uh, that we see in our day, uh, we as Christians have to be unified around the truth. In, a, in our culture today, we see uh, the Democratic Party and, and uh, the mainstream media and a lot of uh, educational institutions pushing the acceptance of many different forms of sexual perversion that are clearly condemned in the Bible. And there are some churches that are going along with this. And uh, then when someone stands up and says, but wait, the Bible's against that, they'll say, quit being divisive. You're being divisive. What well, no, a standing for the truth isn't being divisive. I mean... It's the people that are bringing in the false doctrines that are being divisive. You see, if we know the things that are truly taught in God's word and proclaimed in the gospel and in the scriptures, that's where our unity is to be found, around the truth. And these lesser things that are not clear in God's word, we, we have to stand firmly for the truth while being gracious and respectful with those who hold differing views on disputable matters this uh, when when we are when our hearts are comforted and we're knit together in love this helps us to realize the riches of the full assurance of understanding in other words God wants us to understand his word and his truth and his principles and have the assurance of them to be assured of them and uh, there, there are great riches that he has for us, riches of wisdom and knowledge. And uh, so to understand the truths of God's word, to have the assurance or confidence in them, that's described as riches of, of great spiritual value. Now this leads us to the third verse. Well, uh, to, or to the, the final part of this verse, I should say, of verse 2. And all riches of the full assurance of understanding. Then he says, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. The mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. Now what's he talking about, the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ? Well, some pagan religions have had certain beliefs that they kept a secret. These beliefs were hidden, and these secrets, or mysteries as they were called, would only be revealed to those who were initiated into the religion. So if you decided to follow a certain religion, and you went through an initiation, you were told some of the secrets, some of the mysteries of that false idolatrous religion. And Paul uses the same word mysterion to refer to God's plan of salvation, how Jew and Gentile can know uh, God through Jesus Christ, God's Son. So unbelievers, uh, why did Paul use that word? Well, there's a similarity. Unbelievers do not grasp the mystery of Christ, God in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, bringing Jew and Gentile together into one body. The unbelieving world, they haven't been initiated uh, into the kingdom of God. They haven't been born again. They don't have the Holy Spirit of God, so they don't grasp this. Well, they might grasp parts of it, but they don't fully grasp it, but it is revealed to believers 
you and I who are saved through the word accompanied by the Holy Spirit. So let me just read you uh, the some passages of scripture that talk about God giving us uh, light. He enlightens us so we can see what is a mystery to the unsaved world, people outside of Christ. They don't understand it. They don't see it. It's hidden from them, but revealed to us. The mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. <clears throat> Luke 10, <clears throat> 21 and verse 22. It says, in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hid these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them unto babes. So what the world considers wise and prudent, God hid some of these spiritual truths from them and he revealed them unto babes. That's the way the world would look at us. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things are delivered to me by my Father, and no man knows who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. Okay, so the Father knows the Son, and the Son knows the Father. Nobody knows the Father except for the Son, and to whom the Son will reveal him. So see, God has to reveal himself to us, more than just through the creation. I mean, if we look around, anybody who's honest can look at the creation and say, wow, there's a really powerful, wise God that made all this. But we need more than that general revelation. And, and we need more than the word. We need the Spirit of God with the word to open our eyes and our understanding. God has to speak to us and turn the, turn the light on inside our hearts. John twelve thirty six through 40, Jesus said, While you have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. You know, there's a consequence. If we have light from God, light meaning knowledge, understanding, then we need to follow that and act upon it, receive it, and believe it and act upon it. Uh, because um, God may just take the light away from people who continue to reject it. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? It's interesting, Isaiah chapter 53, that more than 500 years before Christ came, Isaiah described the sufferings of Christ and the rejection of Christ in chapter 53. The chapter begins by prophesying of Israel's widespread unbelief. There would be some people to whom the Lord would reveal his plan and program, but Israel as a whole would be in unbelief. That's what he means. Lord, who hath, uh, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Well, the arm of the Lord, meaning God's working, has re been revealed to me and to you and to all of us who have come to God through Jesus Christ and put our faith in him. God has revealed his arm to us. In Matthew 16, Jesus asked the disciples, Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Remember Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father who is in heaven. See, the Father in heaven revealed that to Peter. And you know, for you and for me, why did we come to Christ? Why did we understand the gospel and receive it, whereas others don't understand it or they reject it? Well, because God worked in our hearts, revealed it to us, and gave us the desire and the power to want to respond in a positive way. 
1 Corinthians 2 says, We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So here's this mystery of God, hidden wisdom, God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, right? Yeah, if they would have known the wisdom of God, they wouldn't have crucified him. But they did because they didn't know it. As it, as it is written, I is not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Do you hear that? God revealed that to us by his Spirit. And uh, he says that the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So see, it says, We have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Okay, so that's 1 Corinthians 2, verses 7 through 14. So you see, we we understand that mystery, because God gives us the Holy Spirit, so... We don't need this, uh, you know, the the philosophies of man that were part of this uh, this false religion, uh, this what I would call proto gnosticism, that was troubling the Colossians. They uh, they claim to possess like some deeper knowledge and wisdom, but Paul makes it clear, you know, you don't need that because uh, in Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Let me read to you um, what 1 Timothy 3.16 says. Uh, a, a few thoughts about this mystery I want to wrap up. He says, without doubt, uh, great is the mystery of godliness. So here he's going to define the mystery of godliness, right? What is this mystery that you and I understand and those outside of Christ do not? Well, here it is. God was manifest in the flesh. You see, that's who Jesus is. God manifest in the flesh. Like Colossians says, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So God was manifest in the flesh. This is a mystery of godliness. So God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. What I think that means is that he arose from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit, and also the Holy Spirit testified uh, of him that he is the Son of God. Then he was seen of angels. Angels observed the, the whole thing. And then he was uh, preached unto the Gentiles, right? And uh, the message of the gospel went out into the Gentile world. And he was believed on in the world, people from all over, both Jew and Gentile. And he was received up into glory. So that's the mystery of godliness, that God was manifest in the flesh in the person of Christ. And he came to save us. This message was preached and proclaimed, and now Christ is up in heaven at the right hand of the Father. The world doesn't see that. The world doesn't understand it. It's a mystery that's hidden to them, but revealed to us by the working of the Spirit of God in us through the Word of God. Well, it says here, In whom in Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So, to have the Wisdom and knowledge of God, that's, that's a great treasure. And these treasures are hid in Christ. So these false teachers that believed that they had access to a deeper knowledge and wisdom, Paul makes it clear that the riches of, uh, of all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, they're hidden in Christ. So see, knowing God through Christ and understanding the truths of God's word, 
that equips us to accurately perceive reality and wisdom. We, we learn it from God. What is wisdom? Well, it's insight into the true nature of things, the ability to see things as they really are, which gives us a skillfulness in living based on an understanding of God's word and his principles. That's true wisdom, not the wisdom of the world, but the wisdom that comes from God. And we find that wisdom in God and in Christ and uh, in learning his word and following his truth. So the, the truth of scripture is that God is wise and he's willing to shower upon us his wisdom if we seek it from him. You know, Proverbs chapter 2 verses 1 through 7 gives us some guidance about this and instruction. He says, my son, if you will receive my words, in other words, accept what I say and lay up my commandments with you. So learn them and make them a part of you. Think about them. Make them a part of your thinking, God's commandments. Uh, now this is Solomon talking to his son, but uh, you know the same is true. We've got to accept God's words, lay up his commandments in our heart so that you will incline your ear unto wisdom. So ready to hear the word of God and his principles in his word and apply your heart to understanding. See, I want to have understanding and wisdom. Good judgment. Yea, if you cry after knowledge and lift up your voice for understanding. So you pray and ask God for it. If you seek her as silver and search for her as hid treasure. So look for knowledge and understanding from God some, as something you would seek that was valuable like silver and hid treasures. He says, then shall you understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom. God gives wisdom. Out of his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. You want knowledge and understanding and wisdom? Study and learn the word of God. And develop a, the habit of thinking according to a biblical worldview. God lays up sound wisdom for the righteous. He has it stored up. And he wants us to ask him for it and to seek for it, and he'll grant it to us. Proverbs 4, 5 through 7 says, Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, either turn away from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve you. Love her, and she shall keep you. You, you seek and get God's wisdom and understanding. It'll preserve you and keep you and protect you from a lot of harm that's in this world through sin and foolishness. You'll be protected. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom with all thy getting, get understanding. So we're to seek wisdom and understanding and to value it and to seek it from God, right? And I close with this, James 1, 5 through 7 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally, which means generously, and reproaches not, upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. What that means is if we pray for wisdom, we have to expect and believe that God will give it to us. Because if we say, well, I'm going to pray for wisdom even though I know it won't do any good anyway, that's wavering in your faith. And, you know, let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. You think you're going to get your prayers answered if you pray with that attitude and in doubt? I think not. That's the point of James 1, 5 through 7. So, he tells us, in Christ... You don't know, need this so-called deeper, higher knowledge and wisdom that the, uh, you know, that the proto-gnostics are promoting. In Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So we have no need of pagan-based philosophies. We find wisdom in God and in his Son, Jesus Christ, and in his Word. So the treasure of wisdom and knowledge are hid in him, and revealed to us, you and I who know and seek 
God's face. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he lift up his countenance upon you, and may he give you his peace, and may he impart wisdom and knowledge and understanding to him, uh, to, to you as you follow him and seek his face. Amen.